this is one of my downsides of being like, I don't even want to say a perfectionist. I have to do everything myself. <laughs> to delegate, I think, is one of my hardest things, which I'm still learning today how to do. I like to do everything myself. I like every cake to have my finishing touch before it goes out the door. Then I had to make this decision of, is this sustainable? I'm not going to be making 30 cakes a week on my own. Like, come on here. If I don't try it now, I will never try it. I'm like, guarantee I was 28 at the time. And I did it. I literally packed up my things and I moved country on the 4th of March in 2020. Now let's talk about that cake you're about to go make, maybe even while listening to this podcast. I want to know what you're going to present it in. A basic box with extenders wrapped in cellophane? I really hope not. There really is a simpler way to go about this by using Olber tall cake boxes. They're super strong, luxurious. They assemble in a minute with no extenders, no cellophane, and no fuss. Best of all, you get peace of mind when you hand it to your customer for its journey home, knowing it will arrive safely. You've just spent hours making that cake, so why not present it in something that shows it off? Check us out at www.olba.shop. Georgia was one of the first people I approached about Olba boxes when we first launched. This is early 2020, just before the pandemic. It's amazing to think three years later, she's on our podcast. Georgia has done so much in baking in such little time. The home cake business. She went to a commercial kitchen. She supplied cakes to brands like Harrods. She's done training and classes. She then moved the business to Israel. I mean, she set up an in-person cake school. She partnered with somebody. And then she's also, during all this, built a very successful YouTube channel. It's hard to know where to start, but we certainly did enjoy this chat. She opens up quite a bit about how all this started and she's had to make so many changes along the way to keep the business going and specifically growing in a direction she wanted it to. She's not the type to sit still and you might be quite surprised to hear just how much Georgia's Cakes has added, removed and changed different things over a few short years. She's quite private, so we're really honoured to be able to talk to her and get to know more about the real Georgia herself. I think you'll really enjoy this one. So let's hear Georgia's baking journey. What's really nice is you're established and as much as you may not think that you are, Georgia, because I have one, two, three, four, five pages of notes here compiled <gasps> by Rachel about you. Wow. And she does a lot of the research. She does all the research, what am I talking about, on all of our guests. And she doesn't always come up with five pages. So it's, <laughs> it's, right, it's really quite yeah, good. <laughs> You've made her job easier in some respects because at least there's stuff about you we can go figure out. <laughs> and there's lots of places to actually dig in and track your journey, which is really cool. But what's interesting is nobody, or I can't say nobody, a lot of people will know this who've researched you, but a lot of people won't know this about you, is that you really were going to go study nothing to do with culinary skills or cakes or anything like yeah. that. I would even call you a bit of a nerd because I'm a nerd. Like you're good at maths. <gasps> you're into like architecture. You got me. But then you also have the creative, obviously, because <laughs> you really, you like photography. Your interests are varied, but it's not like you're just 100% creative. You're on both sides, right? No, exactly. Yeah, I think that was part of the struggle. And it's nice that you've given the background so I don't have to go into all the complex, but you said it quite well. Like I had this balance between academic subjects and then creative subjects. And especially in England, I know that we have listeners from all over, but in England, you kind of have to decide your direction pretty early on. When you're choosing your GCSEs when you're 14, 15, you're already narrowing down your subject choices to then study at A-level to then go on to university. So that's quite early on. So I kind of followed what I was good at. And like you said, it was a mix. Yeah, it definitely is a mix. And you keep going down this path though too, because it's almost like, you know, you want to keep learning more and more about it. But in the back of your head, you've got something else telling you, I don't know if this is really what I want to do. This is really the right path. Yeah. And that just keeps growing for you? Like it's always there? Yes. And I think later on, we'll definitely see why that. I'm always like, not necessarily looking for something else but looking for the next thing, the next experience, even the next skill. 
even not necessarily specific to create something creative. But back when I was kind of figuring out what I wanted to do, I did try a few things before I got into cakes and baking. What would you say you went the furthest path down before you got into baking? Well, I did an art foundation course. I don't know if you know or anyone listening knows. An art foundation is, here's lots of subjects in art. Because even though art was one subject at school, there's many categories in art. And even within that year, I chopped and changed between graphic design, fine art, fashion design, textiles, costume. Then I kind of landed myself in animation. No one else was doing animation at the time. So I was like the only student on the course doing it. And I actually, my final project of my animation course was me hosting a cookery show and all the food was animated. Yeah. And <laughs> everything I did from that point was actually food related. And that was kind of like an inkling to, oh, okay, I've got a slight obsession around food here. <laughs> yeah, because I understand too, from your animation time, you, you realize too, you're not the person to just sort of sit behind a screen and just, you know, you're not really, you're using your hands, but like with a mouse, it's not really the same way, right? And no. you're, not, you're creating, but you're creating behind this wall and it's just a very different approach. And I don't yes. think that, it didn't sound like that gelled well with you. No, and also what you have to understand is when, it's, well, even growing up, dream job at Disney sounded incredible, but the reality with animators is that it's all computerized. So even in the old, I want to say the olden days, but you know, back a few, like before a few years, they were hand drawing things still. And now the only hand drawing would be very rough sketches of a storyline of a movie. And then it's hours upon hours sitting at a computer. So most of the people who are now doing animation are actually computer programmers. And that's definitely not me. So like there were nice creative parts of it. Like we did do a few 3D animations, but it wasn't like allowing me to explore myself creatively. Yeah. So that's where I had this like, gosh, I've gone through all of this to get to this point and I'm still not satisfying my creativity. What else is there? It's like a gut feeling though, isn't it? It's like something that's saying to you, this isn't right. This isn't right. I'm not really enjoying this. It's quite a slog. It's quite... Um, For sure. And having to spend all those hours doing something that you don't enjoy. And then you just see this spark of, I don't know how the Cordon Bleu advert came to you, whether it was just walking down a corridor or it was... Tell us that story because I think it's really interesting. <laughs> Yeah. So again, I think this like inkling at the back of your head saying that this isn't right, but right there in front of you, you kind of had no choice. And especially for me, and don't forget, it also costs money, all of these things. So yeah. meanwhile, like, even though, yes, you can get student loans, it was still money spent on the education. And then it was actually a girl who was doing the same course. And I was, I kind of was like, oh, we've got this lesson today. And she's like, it's a bit weird that you're not excited like I am. And I was like, wait, you like what we're doing? <laughs> and she's like, yeah, I love it. I'm excited to come in every day. And I was like, yeah, I'm not. And she's like, I think that's a sign to say you're not fully enjoying the course and this isn't for you. And that was at the same time as, I can't remember where I saw the ad, but I do remember missing a day of college, literally bunking because they were quite strict with our attendance. And I just, made my way to Cordon Bleu and saw this open day. And I was like, yeah, I'm not going to tell anyone that I'm here. I don't even think I told my parents. And it was like that. I got a cartoon mind. So you can imagine me walking in and going like, my <laughs> big eyes open. And I'm like, oh my God, like people do this as a living. And then like walking through the school is amazing because they have these windows in the classes. And I was just like, with my hands on the glass, like, oh my God, I'm so jealous of everyone here. And I hadn't had that feeling about anything else prior to that moment. Then I had the conversation with my parents and they said, again, changing your mind. <laughs> like, anyway, this is the last time. This is your last chance. And I was like, I promise it will be worth it. Yeah. And hopefully <laughs> I've proved to them the decision was, but 100%. I can totally relate to that. I feel like I was, I was going to go and become a surgeon like my dad in university and and then I was in university and I started working in technology as my job in university was to teach professors how to use computers because we would just start getting computers and the internet and I had no idea and I realized that teaching these professors how to do this was also getting me favors because it meant I didn't have to do my homework on time I could bring it in late 
I could coordinate exam times with them as long as I made sure I was giving them the appointments to teach them how to do stuff. And I was really having a lot of fun. And I said to my dad, I don't think I want to do med school and all that. And it's like, ooh, I don't know. You're on a slippery road there. <laughs> Where are you going with this? So I've already got a job <laughs> yeah. lined up. When I graduate, they're going to pay me this much money. It's going to be great. And he's like, all right, six months. I'll give you six months. Let's have another chat. Six months later, how's it going? Oh, I've got another job. You're going to pay me more money in tech. At that point, he's like, yeah, okay. I've lost you now. You know, fine. Yeah, it's at first, like, I think we're all kind of set out as like this, uh, with this expected path. And then in reality, there are other options out there. You don't have to have the nine to five office job. There are other jobs that don't require those specific hours, which hence being on this podcast, yeah. <laughs> we're hearing about people who have these alternative jobs, but that doesn't mean it's not the correct thing to do. But what I found is that it was, it was quite a struggle going through school because it's more of an expected path. You do this, you get these grades, you go to university and then you get a job. But I think, and I was actually having this conversation recently with someone is like, you won't know until you try it. And taking that step is scary. Like all my friends were finishing a degree before I was even getting into Cordon Bleu. So I already felt like I was behind. But it's worth it if you know deep down it's not right for you. I think it's a really brave move. And I think you're incredibly lucky at quite a young age to actually have that spark to have actually gone into Cordon Bleu and go, wow, this is amazing because most of us do go through that path, A-levels, university, and then get a job. And then that's the trajectory that we go on from there. But I think it's incredibly lucky and brave to actually walk away from the expected path and actually go step into the unknown and step away, especially with your peers as well, because it's kind of a, you probably feel like a failure in front of them because you just can't figure out what you want to do. And you... Yeah, 100%. Like they were getting degrees and I still don't have a degree <laughs> and even nowadays I'm a bit like oh what am I you know if I have if when I have kids what am I going to tell my kids oh well I went down the obvious path but I want you to have a degree <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think you've got a far more interesting story <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Rachel she almost went for Gordon Bleu as well at some yeah point. I did I was exploring it I quit my corporate job I used to work at Apple and I started exploring baking. So it was breads, biscuits, everything, chocolate. Those are amazing. It days. just became an obsession, Delicious. right? You replace one thing for another. And then we were relocating back from Singapore to the UK. And I was thinking, what am I going to do? And I was looking at this cordon bleu and I was like, oh, I have to. And then I was thinking, gosh, am I going to waste more time going off and doing a course? And, you know, it is. And at the time I was like, oh, maybe I'll open a cake business and try it down that avenue. But Cordon Bleu looked really incredibly exciting just to be fully immersed in learning everything to do with patisserie. Yeah. I kind of put myself on my own four month intensive course on that at home, like every day going through like Helen Goh's dessert book with Otterling. And Oh, those are, uh, these are just Sweet. memories are coming back yes, of these recipes exactly. out of the kitchen now. <laughs> but it's that journey. And then, so I'm really intrigued to kind of understand from Cordon Bleu what you felt you learned, because it's not often that we actually talk to someone who is professionally trained and has gone down this avenue. So I'm interested in learning what you learned from that whole experience and how that has helped you as you've gone into this, the cake world. So it's a good question, but I think I had in my mind before I even started is I know the story. And I'm, again, I'm not saying this in a negative way, but I know like quit X and then start making cakes from home, which so many people have done and people have made an incredible business out of it. But I felt by having a formal training would not at all make me better, but have something else to kind of offer I can then have the knowledge and adapt things to make it very much my own style to then apply to whatever I did. Meaning I wasn't going into Cordon Bleu saying I'm going to have a cake business in a year's time at all. I did go in saying, I don't want to work at a hotel or restaurant, which is kind of how they train you up to be. But I do want this extra understanding because yes, maybe one day I will want to do something on my own. And I'd like to think that people will appreciate that higher level of training. And therefore, you know, if you're offering a luxury product, there's my reasoning for it. 
if that makes sense. No, I was going to ask that, like, because it's right after that that you started putting yourself in jobs in food, right? Working at a deli, working, you know, in cafes. And yeah. well, I guess what I'm trying to ask is, like, how much of that could you apply just straight away? Did it just prepare you immediately for when you walked in, or was that just a completely different? So, no. It, so, what's actually amazing was seeing the contrast between Cordon Bleu and the cafe I was working in. So, luckily, I found a job in central London, which was like, a few minutes up the road from the school and they were very flexible with my hours. So some days I went to Cordon Bleu, like we started 8 a.m. and we had a three-hour class or lecture and then I'd go to the cafe and complete my shift, for example, for the rest of the day or vice versa. And Cordon Bleu is very much like clean, polished, high-end. And I would say the only thing is in reality, it's not quite like that in the real world. Like everything is literally shining white and new. And in reality, most kitchens, yes, they're clean, but it's <laughs> usually in a basement or like no windows. And you're not in your sh- chef hat with a neck scarf and a clean apron. It's the real world. And it's more, very much more hands on. You're not making like one eclair at a time. You're making a huge amount. You're using lots of physical energy. And so what I'm saying is that you kind of have this like lovely polished version at the school and what it taught you were skills and how to do things. But in order to bake up larger quantities and how to see uh, how a business runs was coming from my work at the cafe. So I had a good balance. Other people on my course still had regular jobs going on the side or they were just doing this for the time being. I was actually the only one in my small class that was working in food at the same time, which is kind of how I think I reflect of my work today is kind of this in between. At the cafe, we were making flapjacks, cupcakes, brownies. At Cordon Bleu, I was making a croque and bouche and entremets. And I kind of meet it in the middle. Let's be honest, like no one's going to order a flower piped lemon tart for their birthday but I also don't want to just be making a tray of cupcakes. So let's kind of take the cupcakes to the next level from what I've learned at Corner Blood. Do you know what I mean? so There's mm. this kind of mix between. And it started back then when I had the job. So I was getting both sides. Yeah, I can see that now. It makes a bit more sense because you're getting a bit of a dose of reality and formal training and just blending those in. Because you're right, it's a total mess. You go, I mean, especially if it's a busy <laughs> cafe and... You know, you've got hundreds of people coming through a day and you're working long hours. And Yeah. The real world, a successful cafe is a nightmare to work in the back of. I've worked in restaurants and fine dining as well. And even in fine dining, if it's busy, it's still a bit of a chaotic, organized, yeah. but chaotic mess back there of doing stuff. So I can certainly see how that, that blends in. But then is this this point of working in the cafe and then you know, you're obviously creating a lot of sweets and desserts and whatnot. There's a point where people sort of tracking onto what you're doing and asking you directly for orders for them. Yeah. Okay. Sort of outside of the cafe, but you're still working there. Exactly. So actually, all I worked in two, three places, but the two main ones that I was thinking of is the managers were really nice and I was able to use the kitchen after hours for my own stuff. Are these cafes still around, by the way? No, they actually, they've actually got <laughs> such a shame. It's a shame you go back down memory yeah, lane. Yeah, no, there was, I think they were taken over. One was a coffee company mainly and another was a local deli. But they were both quite, I would say family run. They weren't actually families, but we were like in touch with the managers directly. We also had our own freedom of what we were doing. And there was this sense of, I think I've said it before, I used to bring upstairs a tray of brownies that I just made go back down and then come up and bring something else. And I see a customer eating it. And like, I smile and like, they notice that I'm the chef and then they're like, wow, brownies are delicious. And I was like, oh my God, thank you. And like, there's this kind of, you don't see many chefs because they're in the back, but the places I worked at, you actually had this customer interaction. And especially the second, the deli that I used to work in, it was much more local and friendly. And I was coming up and down all the time. Everyone knew my name. And that was when kind of people started to, ask me specific for orders so they can obviously see I do the baking oh my daughter's birthday's coming up is there something you can do and that's where the cake orders started coming so yes I was making the coffee cakes and Victoria sponges for the cafe but then I'd make something a bit more special for someone's birthday and then that person has a friend who also has the birthday coming up and 
we all know that even though the wonders of social media, but word of mouth, especially when it's something like cake that someone is experiencing it in front of them and eating it, there's nothing better than word of mouth to get your name around. What year are we talking when this started? 2015, I want to say. Okay. Why? I know I'm a bit jumping, so bring me back if we're losing track, but it's kind of in the same timeline. I was making cakes on a more regular basis by then, but it wasn't until Instagram started and as well as the opportunity to make a cake for Cara Delevingne back in 2015, did then the Instagram come into play and my orders went up and through Instagram. I think you need to explain that story though about <laughs> Cara <laughs> and you know, your, your sister. Was and, of, and, yeah. Yeah. and actually getting a brand for yourself because I read that that time you hadn't even got an Instagram account. And actually it's really early, like 2015. Yeah. You know, I think most things were still going through Facebook at that stage. So Yeah. So actually my Facebook was still quite local and I was starting to get a few messages through there. It had about a thousand followers. And I think back then it was more local, like they tracked your location and so like people locally followed you. But yeah, so I was making these cakes, I was taking some photos of them, and then I heard of this thing called Instagram. I could not understand it. I didn't know what a hashtag was. I didn't know what tagging meant. What you have a page, it's like Facebook, but just photos. Anyway, my, yeah, so my sister's now fiance's sister, that's the connection, worked in fashion. And she heard I was doing cake. She goes, George, I've got this amazing opportunity for you. We're doing a lot DKNY collaboration with Cara Delevingne. We want to present her with a cake. We want you to make it. And I was like, wow, that sounds cool. Oh, and she's going to tag you on Instagram. And I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> and so, like, in a week, I made this account. I put some awful photos, which I think I ended up deleting because, you know, when you first got Instagram, you, you were obsessed with all those filters on it. <laughs> so oh, yeah. I kept seeing these Borders filters on filters. these things. <laughs> oh, like with the, yeah, horrible colors. And, but I just had to have something. And, also, you have to think of your name. Yeah. So in panic mode, what do I call my... Oh, I'll just do George's Cakes <laughs> because what else can it be called right now? And it stuck. And anyway, so I made this cake. When it was out of fondant, I kind of made a jacket of one... It was one of the pieces of the line that Cara was, had collaborated. Again, looking back on it, and I don't work with fondant anymore. And I was just like, oh my God, I can't believe I presented that but anyway at the time it was great and I presented it to her and my sister so she she's four years younger than me I can't now work out how old she was but she's like very much in the Instagram era and she was like whatever you do get her to get your details and tag you that is the most important thing like, okay so I like gave this cake to Kara and I was like, I made it. And she's like, oh my God, it's amazing. I was like, can you tag me? And like, I didn't even believe myself. <laughs> Asking the right still question. Wasn't quite... She goes, yeah, sure. Took out her phone, wrote down at George's Cakes. Anyway, and then gave her the cake. She actually tried some, believe it or not. And then later on in that day, I think I came out of the underground and my phone just went beep, 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 <laughs> with notifications. So much so that like it drained the battery within a few minutes and my phone turned off and I was like, what's going on? And it turned out she uploaded the photo of the cake. I think at the time she might have had a million followers. That's pretty good going for back then. Yeah. I think, yeah, at one million was like kind of the top range yeah. of audience back then. And I went from a, a few hundred to I think six or 7,000, which literally in a half a day. And then it was from that moment, I had this kind of side project and I was like, okay, this is like my new thing now. So every cake I do, I'll upload on this platform, take a photo of it, <laughs> use some hashtags. And that was became my portfolio. So I always say I had that boost at the beginning, which was helpful and at the right time, supposedly, because I feel like my page grew as Instagram grew. But it was amazing how many orders actually came through the Instagram page after that. Ah, okay. There's really like the launch of your baking brand and career through that. And then all of a sudden, it's, but is this manageable? I mean, you're taking these orders and you've got a day job still. So I had the day job. It was I started at eight. Well, I was actually in charge of my hours, but 
I made myself get their face, which isn't actually too early in the baking world. Yes. But I was also preparing the, yeah, yeah. As, as you probably know, preparing salads and savory things as well. That was me totally like, I like, I say Ottolenghi style, like just like good use of vegetables, cooking them correctly, even big pieces of chicken with some nice flavorings on. Nothing, well, I'd say nothing too fancy. Ottolenghi style is like very fancy, but quite simple home cooked food. And that all went out before 12 o'clock. And then the afternoon was my baking time, which I usually prepped for the following day. So it was always a day ahead. And then when I had finished that, everything off my list, I would then stay X amount of hours after baking my cakes. So I haven't even realized back then before my business has started, I was doing very long working days. I was about to say, but baking is incredibly physical and very tiring on your feet. I mean, just working in that environment and I'm thinking it's already probably a jam packed day, just getting everything ready for the bakery and very physical and mental as well. It's very draining because you're concentrating a lot. And then to be doing these cakes afterwards and liaising back into with customers and Instagram messages and then also, you know, delivering these back to customers. And, you know, there's a lot of, you must have been pretty, there must have been some really long days. That's all I can think and quite tiring moments. Really long, really tiring. I was on my own for a lot of the time. And then I convinced the manager to hire someone else to help me. And then what happened is I started prioritizing my own orders And then I was doing things like I noticed that I was, I would use the word slacking in the sense I was doing the minimal possible. So rather than going over and beyond and overproducing for the cafe, I was like, I have to finish by two because I've got my orders. And it happened a few times and I kind of caught myself out and it was, I don't like working, not to my 100%, whatever I do, if it's for myself, if it's for someone else. And the second that I noticed I wasn't putting 100% into my work, I thought to myself, something has to change. Am I in that position to stop working at the cafe, stop a salary and go full time on my own and making that scary jump, similar to the jump of me deciding against animation. And I was thinking, yes, how could I miss this opportunity working for myself, building something up for my own? That's not even something I was even, I was actually thinking of beforehand, but I was like, no brainer. Let's be my own boss. <laughs> Rather than me baking for someone else, I could be baking for myself, also financially. And that's when I made the decision. And to just go, if it doesn't kick off, I could pay rent for six months. Let's give it six months. Let's put my all into what I'm doing. Let's see how it goes. I made the jump and have never looked back since that moment. Was that roughly around the same time where you posted the your time lapse video that went a bit viral on Instagram? Yes, it was. That I actually think that was after I made the decision to go completely self-employed a few months after because I had more time to focus on what I was doing and I noticed obviously my Instagram was growing and people liked seeing what I was doing. I tried oh it's when Instagram introduced the 15 second videos. I was like, how am I going to fit a whole cake decoration in 15 seconds? Let's do a time lapse. So I did this time lapse. I think it was a Frasier cake with the strawberries around the outside, which I learned at Cordon Bleu. (laughs) So there's my little (laughs) crossover. So I think I only had a few thousand followers at the time, maybe not even 10, but the video got about 80,000 views. And I was like, what? Like, how has that happened? Then Instagram as in the company, got in touch with me via email, the London team going, we noticed you've up, like you're using the video feature. We would love for you to come into a workshop at the head office with a few other creators. And I was like, wow, this is cool. This is something. And so I went and there was about 20 of us. And funnily enough, I'm actually still in touch with some of the creators that I met that day. And I've watched how their brands have developed. And we were, I guess, the early video creators And I actually don't know the year of this, and I should. Probably 2017, around 2017, 16 or 17 now, they were going, this is going to be a video first platform. And we were like, what are you talking about? Like, obviously, Instagram is posting photos, but little did we know they were right. (laughs) They knew that they were going to go in that direction, which is actually quite interesting to see, especially what it's come to today, that they were prioritizing video back then. Then they introduced the one minute videos, which was amazing because you didn't have to squeeze the whole cake into 15 seconds. 
what happened from the videos was I was getting traction from companies. And that's also when Tastemade got in touch. Now, Tastemade is this online food platform. They were focused around Instagram and Snapchat at the time, which is also up and coming. And they got in touch looking for taste makers, so actual personalities. Now, my page was very much about my cakes. I then put a photo of me because actually, Rachel, as you said before, like that I'm lucky that I'm younger than most people realize when they kind of do the job and then turn to baking. And I'm like, okay, let's just remind people that I'm like, hey, I'm 20 something doing this. And it must have paid off because they were like, you look great. We want you (laughs) like you look like this fun personality. And I'm like, I've never been on camera before, apart from my animation final project. And they're like, we want you in for a trial to do some savory and some sweet cooking. And I'm like, I don't do savory, but sure. And I went and I made, I actually made a shakshuka and I made some brownies as my trial. And then I kind of said to them, I was like, you know, my thing is cakes, not more than anything. <laughs> and they're like, oh, okay. Anyway, and then they really like the idea. They didn't figure this out <laughs> at all. I would just get her in. I don't, what does she do? I don't know. She bakes. I don't know. <laughs> and she has food on her Instagram. Anyway, so I kind of convinced them that that was my thing. And so I remember the first shoot, for some reason, it felt really natural. I think because I was so, by then I was so confident in what I was doing. I just like stood in front of the camera, didn't really bother me though as a camera. And I just went for it. And I was like, oh, that that was quite nice. I, I quite enjoyed that. Then they asked me back to do another like six episodes with them. And then I became more of a regular I guess t- taste maker was the term that they were using. And speaking in front of the camera, sharing knowledge became more natural. And I'm speaking a lot and jumping, but that's also why the YouTube idea came into it, which then goes on to a whole other path. I don't know if I've missed anything or if I'm totally <laughs> stepping away from the story. There's a step here, though, that I'm curious about is you know, when you left and you started working for yourself, obviously you couldn't, you were lucky enough to be able to have a kitchen to use at the cafe. Mm when you were doing your side orders. So what did you have to do then? Were you back to home baking when you were taking orders on your own? Yeah. And it's a good question because I think it even still applies nowadays if someone is interested in cooking from their own home. There are certain licenses that you have to do. So I think slightly before I made the move to home, I did look into it. And I want to say, if it's still correct, that in your local council, you can get your kitchen, your home kitchen registered as a safe environment to sell produce from. Yes, in the UK, yeah. Yeah. And so I did that. I got, I was actually using a friend's to begin with and then I moved to another apartment with my boyfriend back then and got the kitchen inspected by the local council. Five star, obviously. (laughs) And also (laughs) though, but the funny thing is even they say cake is like the least risky food ever. Like the only bad thing probably could come from it is like you use a bad egg you know in comparison to people using meats and mixing meats with raw food etc so I I did set that up my kitchen was a small one-bedroom apartment size kitchen with a tiny under-the-counter fridge and looking back I had no idea how I did this I didn't even know how we we had food at the same time as me having a cake order. But I quickly then realized, say, ah, oh, okay, this is a bit trickier than I imagined. What are the options? And yeah, I'm sorry, I can't remember exactly which year we're in now. I think 2017 now, I was like, I don't want to be cooking at home anymore. I want to find an external kitchen, which I did. And um, so I was paying double rent, but it meant I can make more. I actually had someone to help me. And I was doing larger orders, not necessarily larger cakes, but PR companies wanted like to send out cakes. So one week I remember accepting 30 cakes and I was like, yeah, I can do this. I don't know how I did it. I finally convinced them 30 30, like regular, like six inch tall cakes. And I was like, yeah, (laughs) just as I was like, (laughs) I've got the space, I can do it. I love Um, the naivety in your 20s. (laughs) Yeah, I can do it. Right? So luckily with cake, though, you can spread the process. Obviously, it was a learning curve to get there. It's not like everything has to be done there and then on the same spot. But still, 30 cakes. I convinced them to split it into two collection days during the week. So I think one was on the Wednesday and then one was on the Friday. So it was 15 and 15. But still, any more than four cakes is 
like a lot. But I couldn't have done that without the external kitchen, for example. Don't get me wrong, I was absolutely nuts to accept it. <laughs> I was talking about this the other day. Was this just all word of mouth or was this just spiraling from your Instagram growth? And I think a bit of everything at this point. Because, yes, because my Instagram had grown, because I had done enough cakes that I sent out quite a few by this point. So I would say this, imagine you make a cake for a party that has 30 people. So you've got 30 different people trying that cake or seeing it. You also got the people who are seeing it on their Instagram because they're posting about it. Then that's the, like, it just spreads out to another 60 people. And so, and you're doing that with several cakes at one time or in the same space of time. So yes, it's quite, I don't want to use the word easy because nothing's easy, but it was doable just through word of mouth, especially in like, like location wise, if you're looking like I was in Northwest London, but through the Instagram as well, I was getting the odd message oh I'm getting married in the north of England or in the Cotswolds or something and I was like okay this is big I started using delivery companies I'm trying to think if there was a point where I was like I'm going to build this huge cake empire but I think and I guess this is one of my downsides of being like I don't even want to say a perfectionist I have to do everything myself (laughs) to delegate I think is one of my hardest things which I'm still learning today how to do I like to do everything myself. I like every cake to have my finishing touch before it goes out the door. Then I had to make this decision of, is this sustainable? I'm not going to be making 30 cakes a week on my own. Like, come on here. Again, I know I'm jumping, but this was at the same time as me creating my YouTube as well. I had someone film all my YouTube videos and I was like, let's just see what happens because people were more interested in how I made the cakes. People started asking for recipes, not just selling the cakes. And at first I was like, no, these are my secret recipes. But then I was like, oh, like they're not me. They can't exactly create my exact design. Let's teach. And so I opened the YouTube channel and that naturally grew quite quickly. I think after 1,000 subscribers, you can start monetizing your videos as well. Yeah, still is 1,000. Is it? And, And I was like, oh, there's a nice little extra revenue coming in from that. So by this point, (laughs) we're losing count here, but like had the taste made thing going, had I was selling cakes and I was still doing everything myself. And then I think I kind of was way too overwhelmed with everything and then decided to kind of almost strip back as to, you know, let's become more of a person behind the cake, only accepting X amount of cakes at one time because overworking is just crazy. I ended up getting rid of the external kitchen and just buying a big fridge to stay at home and focused on like, less more special cakes less quantity and more wedding cakes larger cakes special and let's be honest higher priced cakes rather than going down the large quantity i want to talk about cupcake boxes especially if you need room for tall ones or floral cupcakes there's never really been a cupcake box on the market that gave you the confidence to safely transport them without damaging them Nor has there been anything that makes it easy to place or remove cupcakes without ruining those pretty decorations until now. The Olba Cupcake Box fixes all these issues. Plenty of height, strong, and a gorgeous cupcake box that opens fully into a built-in serving tray. No mess, no fuss, no cupcake teeth, and no damage. Even your customers will appreciate just how easy it is to open the box and serve right from the tray. Check them out at www.olba.shop. So how soon, though, for you to figure out your pricing and all this? Because I I don't think you mentioned Cordon Bleu doesn't teach you about running a business. Trial and error or underpricing at first significantly and then realizing or someone tells you you need to charge more. (laughs) Basically, you said it. Definitely underpricing at first. I think I sold my first cake for £30, even though it took me about five hours. But it was the best cake. I think I found a photo of it the other day. It was like a Barbie cake. And you don't, you can't even see like the rosettes that I piped on because the icing was so soft. It's all right. It was only £30. <laughs> yeah. pounds. What do you expect? Exactly. And then I think with pricing, it's really difficult because I don't think there's one way of doing it. However, and I think it's come up in your one of your other podcasts, is that there is no way of comparing a handmade bespoke cake from one individual to a cake from Marks and Spencer's, which someone has 
said to me in the past, there was an issue, there was miscommunication and they were like, I could have gone to so-and-so. And I'm thinking, go and get Colin the Caterpillar. Nothing wrong with Colin the Caterpillar. Oh, but you're not Colin. going. <laughs> love Colin. But you're not going to get the same experience, the same love and care. Like, there's just, you can't even compare it. So I learned quickly that you can actually price more. But it was trial and error. And a lot of it was confidence, mm. which I had to learn. And I still call myself an accidental influencer. Even using the word influencer, I'm a bit like, oh, could I use that word? But yeah, I guess I influence people in the baking world. And it's like, you have to kind of step back and be like, no, I can charge that. Or at least let's try and charge that. And if people are paying and accepting it, then okay, I'll do something right. And I remember after getting rid of that external kitchen and then going back to home and doing more bespoke cakes, I put up my prices significantly and I wasn't doing anything less for £150, which is a lot for a cake, especially if you're happy with Colin McCaskill. It will McCaskill. be to a lot of listeners listening to that. They're like, I think they will have just had a little quick gasp of breath. Yes, <laughs> yes. Hearing that. And now granted, you are in London at the time, right? Yes, in London. But I was also, look, by the time I was charging £150, something also in, important to add, I was also supplying Harrods with cakes at the same time. So I had reached this high quality level. And I was thinking, yeah, I've worked so hard until this point that if I could be getting paid for, I could do a workshop. I used to do one-to-one workshops and people were paying £300 to do a one-to-one workshop with me. Again, a lot of money, but people saw that as an investment in there. They're learning skills, which I think we'll get on to about the whole teaching side of things. If they're willing to pay £300 just to be with me, then yes, a cake that takes eight hours. And when you break it down like that, £150 for eight hours, minus all the expenses, isn't crazy. But it is difficult for a, 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 the average customer to agree to spend that money. But what happened is that people were still coming to me and really feeling that this was a big moment. They were purchasing this incredible gift for someone or for themselves, if it was for a wedding, for example. And it's more than just a cake at this point. And luckily, I had been able to build that over all of these years to get to that point, which takes me back to saying, I'm not saying to anyone, you open a business, charge £150 for a cake, because it also depends on what type you're doing, what style, your setup, where you are, how much your ingredients cost. There are so many different aspects that I don't think it's not black or white, how much you should charge for a cake. But that was my personal decision. You had the volume, you had the experience, you had the brand. And I think you were probably in a position where you had too many orders of requests coming through. So at that point, you either go two avenues, which is expand and they open a much bigger premises and bring on a team of people and keep that same volume or increase your volume, make more profit. Or you could go upwards with your own prices because there is, you know, there's certainly a demand. And so with that, you might lose a few, but that's okay because you've got so much volume coming through anyway. And exactly, you built up a brand. So with that, you can charge more and should be charging more. Exactly. It's my my perspective. Yeah. And also I think there's comes across again, every baker is different. Everyone who goes into this has a different goal in mind. My goal was to spend more time on one cake as well. So when I was doing the larger quantities, you have to get things done in time and then your quality slips. You can't be a thousand percent if you're doing a large amount. Hence why there are more suitable cakes for larger amounts. Hence like cupcakes, for example, easy, like swirl, 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 sprinkle, sprinkle, like amazing. You can get thousands done. But when you're talking about like one cake, a wedding cake, for example, I would spend two whole days just on one wedding cake. And I enjoyed that the most. That's where my love for it was. I wasn't enjoying the larger quantity. I listened to the episode with Victoria from Victoria's Kitchen. and Oh, yeah, you know Vic very well. You taught yeah, her yeah, school. We, and... Yeah, we, I've taught in her. We've worked together for a while. I love her. And it was interesting because she was all about making the big quantities. <laughs> she was like, I'm happy doing that. And I'm like, yeah. God, I'm actually the total opposite. Which brings me back to the point is that when you are an individual, you have your own individual beliefs and 
needs and desires, which is fine. Everyone's different. Did the Harrods deal screw that up then for you? Because you're talking volume, right? So Harrods, they came to me because they wanted bespoke cakes. So it wasn't like every day I was sending 10 cakes to them, etc. It was a customer would come to Harrods, they see a dummy display of my cakes and others, order it, and then the order would come to me. And they approached you originally? Harrods approached me. It was a very big deal. Obviously, Harrods is like top, top end. And I was like, oh my God. Hence why I'm like, yeah, you know what? I can charge these prices. (laughs) The thing with Harrods was I saw it as a marketing thing more than anything. They take quite a hefty sum from you. Plus, you have to deliver it there. Because for the customer, they're not going to charge for delivery to Harrods. No. Because they're collecting it from Harrods. Right. So they were taking X percentage. I won't say exactly what. And then you had to cover the delivery charge. Now, from my location, it was about £30. So I was getting considerably less from my orders from Harrods. And then I was kind of playing on the, is it worth it? Because I'm getting less yeah, money. You're getting the exposure, but at the same time. Yeah. I think we had another guest, if you ever want to go back and listen, Jane Taylor. She talks about, she does beautiful bespoke floral buttercream cupcakes. And she got approached by Harrods and she was about to do the deal, right? And then she realized that the amount that they were going to take. Oh, I think it was something like an eight pound cupcake. Would she give her a pound? Yeah. <gasps> okay, I had a better deal. Yeah, so <laughs> wow. Well, they she didn't take the deal obviously as a result because she she realized that. Yeah, and I think you know we're not trying to knock Harrods here. I think the point is that you got to play these things right. And Harrods is an amazing marketing engine for you because it's an internationally recognized brand for people who have money to spend as well, right? So it's like, why wouldn't you want to partner up with them? But it has to also make financial sense for your business to work. And again, if you're just trying to do that, and you're like, you've already alluded to your focus is like, you want dedication to really less cakes, but more quality. Yes, it kind of can work, but it kind of cannot like if they are only throwing one cake at you a week, happy days, right? Like, you know, even if you are Mm -hmm. losing out to it, still getting exposure, and you still can devote the time, but you can't control how many cakes they bring to you, right? No. And there were some weeks where I wouldn't hear from them. And then there are some weeks where I'd get four or five orders and have to say no to others because of it. Right. So it was a quite a juggling act. But something to also important to mention that Harrods was also at the same time that I started teaching. So kind of coming on from my YouTube channel and this idea of sharing knowledge. And then I did some in-person group workshops, which also I massively undercharged for at first. (laughs) But I started to teach one-to-ones from my home, like I said, charging a considerable amount and also fell in love with teaching. So I had these two things going on. And then when you step back even more and thinking of like all the stress that goes around getting Harrods or any clients, the stress around a cake, because let's be honest, it's a pretty stressful job. It's not all happy bouncing and flying around in your kitchen making cakes. There's a lot of stress that comes with it. Or this pleasurable teaching experience when you're teaching someone a life skill, which actually luckily came very naturally to me. And seeing someone come in and leave with a stunning cake because of just my teaching, I'm like, wow, this is incredible. And I wanted to move more into that market rather than just selling the cake. So the cakes kind of became more of a side thing. And then the teaching became a focus which also by this point, I was also doing like paid partnerships on Instagram, which we all know can pay quite nicely. So you look at your finances all the time when you're self-employed, pretty much on a daily basis, you have this kind of freak out of, do I have enough money to live? And you're thinking, well, a paid partnership pays this up here. And then you have a cake order. I'd rather take the paid partnership. So by this point, like I was saying, the cakes very much became a side thing for me. So if I was going to do one, I want to price it accordingly to make it worth my while. That's kind of the best way to say why I was pricing cakes at this price as well. I think it's also a bit of marketing too, because you've you know you've been in like the Daily Mail, right? You've been glamour, all this like you you know they love a headline like that. Three hundred Georgia cakes charges three hundred pounds for a cake. You know it stirs a bit of clickbait too, right? To say what on earth are you getting for 300 pounds? Yeah. 
And for those people who do not buy cakes very often, <laughs> they're probably going to read that. They're going to be the people who read this and go, oh my God. But hey, yeah. look, it's awareness for your brand in many respects. Absolutely. And from working in it myself, I've also gained a huge respect for all those independent small businesses. I think there's a big, there's a big wave in England, especially. Support your local baker, support your small business. I'm hugely appreciative. And I notice myself buying more from these small businesses because I am one myself and I appreciate it, which also comes with everything else. Customer service, how you talk to people. You know, it's easy. If you're speaking to a large company, say if you haven't got a washing machine delivered, you can have a go at this guy who's probably not even based in the UK. But when when you've ordered something handmade bespoke for you, it's almost like, yes, you're paying as a customer, but thank you so much for taking your time and creating this beautiful thing. It's a totally different experience to any other sort of purchase that is made. So again, like when ordering a bespoke cake, especially, you cannot compare to going to the supermarket and buying one of those ready-made birthday cakes at all, which I enjoyed. Yeah. And it's nice not to have to even explain that to that customer either, (laughs) you know, that whole process. We've got to talk about like when things shift because you have a major shift in your life. You do not live in England anymore. We're talking to you from Israel. So there is a point that comes across here where you change everything up. (laughs) I shook everyone up. (laughs) The only thing you've kept is your brand name and your YouTube channel. And you're at the pinnacle of success as well. Well, or perceived, perceived right? Externally, like you have an amazing cake business. You're working with lots of brands in the UK, around the world. You're a TV personality. You know, you're doing so many things. It was kind of like you turn the page in a book and you're like, what? And you're like, <laughs> oh, and I was reading about you. I was like, I like this girl. She just, like, <laughs> because it's like your gut feeling is like, this is not right. Be, I, and I'd love you to ex- expand on it. But what I'm doing right now is great, but there's something missing in my life. Yeah. And it did come as a shock to many people. But from, and what I also want to say is I've never been too open about my personal life ever online. Like I have thousands of followers and it's very easy to fall into that trap. I'm not saying it in a negative way because people do it for a living and it's amazing. And like I watch and follow people who happily share everything about their life and it's great entertainment. I, it's not for me. Just as a side note, I, Georgia don't have a personal Instagram, for example. I'm not a very out there person with my personal stuff. So not many people know I'm Jewish and I have a strong connection to Israel. I have family here. I've come here many times on holiday during growing up. I've seen my auntie, my cousins, my grandparents now live here. So yes, to people, it was a shock and going like, why Israel? And it's like, oh, for me, it's like so normal. I'm here all the time. I've got best friends living here. And there is a sense of the style of life. And I'm not just talking about the weather because it's hot and sunny most days, but it helps. I just wasn't feeling 1000% at home in London, even though I've always grown up in London. It's this sense of I'm missing something. It's something I've wanted to try since the age of 14, 15, because I spent a month here when I was that age. It was always at the back of my mind. And what was happening at the moment is I'd cut down my cake orders, like we spoke about. I was becoming more of a personality online, virtually. And yes, I was teaching the in-person workshops, but I was getting more and more opportunities online. And my YouTube was very much growing by then. And a part of me was like, I could probably continue this not being located in the UK. Let's try. No, No one's saying this is forever. But I did make the decision because I was almost like, if I don't try it now, I will never try it. I'm like, guarantee I was 28 at the time. And I did it. I literally packed up my things and I moved country on the 4th of March in 2020. Oh, gosh. <laughs> but before we, before we go timing. into the timing, <laughs> can you just share a bit about how that was building up that feeling? Because... You know, this doesn't just happen overnight. It is no. it is probably months and there's probably quite a few tears. There's probably a lot of discussions to make that big decision and go a different path. Can you share a little bit how you were feeling at the time? Absolutely. So I think because I had always known I wanted to try it, it wasn't so much of a big thing. But I think it took a lot of 
time from especially my family and friends to realize it, that I wasn't kidding around. I was actually going through it. And I think there was obviously a lot of questioning of what's going on with your business. And I was like, I've got confidence that I will continue doing what I do just more online. And the beauty about being here is that it is, it sounds far away, but it is actually only a four and a half hour flight. It's like just at the other end of Europe. Like I said, I've got family here. My family in England are constantly coming across. And it was this very commutable idea. So it's not like I'm going to live in Australia and you're never going to see me again. It was, I'm going to, I'm going to be over there. Come and visit. I'll come back. Funnily enough, I had already booked to come back a month after I had moved for the Passover holiday. We'll get there. Um, And I think I was so focused, maybe even like tunnel vision. I had this end goal in mind. I wasn't really paying attention to actually how others were feeling about me leaving. I was doing it quite selfishly, but it was scary. But what I had also planned, and so it wasn't, again, I didn't just pack up my things and leave, but I was planning it. So I did actually host a few workshops here in Israel, mainly in Tel Aviv and surrounding areas, started to build up a little profile for myself. I met my now business partner during that. We kind of had this chat that we had the same idea in mind, and maybe that's something I could work on when I move, because I had that in mind. So I had kind of used the year leading up to my move as preparation, making contacts, working, moving more online, accepting less cake orders. I remember people asking about wedding cakes for like the following year. And I was like, (laughs) I don't know what to say here. Because like, in theory, I could fly back. But I don't know. Anyway, so Yeah, it wasn't. I know I phrased it like, oh, yeah, I packed my bags and I left. It definitely wasn't as easy as that. And also to move here, there's something called it's called making Aliyah, which is a Hebrew term for like Jewish people moving to Israel. Um, It's almost like, I guess, promoted, like you get a bit of money. They help you out with your shipping. They provide you with Hebrew lessons. Like there's actually a whole organization that you go through. They get you your passport, your ID number, et cetera. So there were official things that I had to go through to the move. You can't just show up on the day with your passport. So I did that all in advance. But I think it was until I kind of saw the moving men in my kitchen taking all my things. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm actually doing this. Wow. I wonder what it's going to be like. So yeah, it wasn't easy. But I'm, wow, I am I am glad. Like it. No, it's a relocating is huge. But it is, it was it is huge. doable. I have done a few in his lifetime. Yeah. Yeah, I think four international. Oh, wow. Oh, so All I'm over nothing. the world too. It's not even like, I've done the Australia one. It is far. You don't <laughs> see people very often. I can vouch for that. It's massively far. Yeah, but the whole idea was, I and I was saying it to myself as well, as like, I'm going to be coming back five to six times a year to do workshops, even for if someone orders a wedding cake and it works out timing wise, like I'm up for it. I moved here to kind of be located in two locations. But like I said, March 2020 was not the best month (laughs) to make that decision. Obviously, we all go into lockdown. And at that point, you start doing a lot more your back to basics YouTube series, which honestly is like, Talk about timing, like phenomenal. I mean, and it's been a phenomenal success as well. But the timing of doing that and you being stuck, quarantined, stuck at your, I think it was your friend's apartment (laughs) with her basic (laughs) kind of baking needs. I'm laughing because I'm throwing myself back to, she had this bench with the kitchen behind, but no one saw what was in front of me. (laughs) It was like her sofa with her cat. They were watching TV at one point, you know, like (laughs) no one was leaving. And I think that is, it's panic mode. But it's almost like, look, I moved March 2020. Here, we went into lockdown on the 10th of March. It was earlier than the UK. All those plans of flying back to England every now and then, my flight four weeks later, me saying bye to my mum from the window, hey, I'm going to get my flight, but I'll see you in a few weeks. So it really doesn't matter. Little did I know I wasn't going to see her for eight months. That was not expected. So everything I thought I would was planning totally like collapsed in front of my eyes and I was thinking what can I do now and luckily the friend I was staying at her now husband a photographer he had a camera that can record I was like great I've got my laptop 
let's do this series. And funny enough, even though a lot of my cake decoration videos do quite well because people like watching them and learning from them, the Back to Basics series, I saw so many people recreate my recipes from that. And I was like, wow, okay. Plus, I was doing virtual one-to-ones as well, which something I had no idea how it was going to do. And luckily, I had that first person to go, yeah, I want to do that. And I was doing something like this with someone in front of the camera with their hand table, with their cake and me going, no, take that point. Yes, put that palette knife there. Yes, now turn. No, the other direction. Yes, that's it. And I was able to guide someone to make a cake through a screen. And I was like, wow. So actually, the idea of doing something online and still continuing my brand was proving successful. And But it's that point, which I'm sure many people went through is, oh my God, what do I do in this moment? Panic, panic. Let's think on our feet. And that was me thinking in that moment of what I could have done there and then. And it helped me get through the toughest time and hopefully one of the toughest time in all of our lives that we've experienced. Plus having moved country. That was like irrelevant at this point. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I think it's great because it's in the sense, it's just forced you to have to come up with something, a strategy, which has worked. We've seen that time again for bakers that we've spoken to when lockdown hits. All of a sudden, something else has come from it you know, whether they become content creators, whether they've found a new avenue in their business to do, pivoted to something else, or picked up a new ability through lockdown just to be able to continue their business and learn from. So, you know, it's just brilliant to see that. But it doesn't stop there, right? Like if we just, okay, we're just going to skip the whole lockdown bit. Yeah. Because there is a point now, if we look at what you're doing today, it's not what you were doing in lockdown really, there's a mix of both. But you now you have an established business partner, you have your training, you have school, right, you're teaching a lot. So yeah, let's talk about how this all came about when this all happened. And I know you said you had it in the back of your mind, because you'd already met this person and you talked about it. So how quickly, you know, did lockdown just sort of force you to just accelerate those plans as soon as things started to open up? Very much. So Liat, my business partner, she and I had this idea and then obviously lockdown hit and then we actually came out of our lockdown, I think in the May, May time. Because that's also when I met my husband, which is another story, another podcast. podcast. Um, But in that May, I think we all felt it after that first lockdown came out. We were like, oh, it's over. Cool. What? Like, let's go back to normal life. And it was within a month, we started looking for places. We found a place, we signed a deal, we opened, and then we got shut down again for lockdown. Um, but we did this very quick decision making. We had, because we kind of had lockdown to think more about it, we were so on the same page of what we wanted to create. We wanted to create a baking school, very much like Victoria's Kitchen. And I openly said to her, I was like, I love your business. I want to use it as a business, like a model for us. And she was like, Yeah, absolutely. Like, <laughs> go for it. Because I just love what she does. But it's this idea of a fun place rather than a something like Cordon Bleu. Yeah, serious place. Still professional though. So we literally opened up the doors at the end of August and then we went into our second lockdown in September. We were like, ah, maybe this wasn't the best idea. So now I can't remember your exact question, but I think it was decision making oh, and whether COVID our decision making. I think it was just, we were still yeah. in this kind of decide in the moment let's not think about it too much. You don't know what's going to happen next kind of thing. But when the second lockdown hit, you you didn't decide to walk away. Obviously, you just, you'd caught enough. We signed, not only did we sign a year for the premises, so we were actually under contract, which maybe wasn't the most sensible thing to do mid-pandemic, but we did it anyway. We did DIY kits. And we quite quickly, I think from together with Liat's local following in Tel Aviv and my larger following, we built up quite a big audience quite quickly from the studio Baker Street. And we did DIY kits where we were making like little cakes and delivering it to people. We were literally going in cars, which was really fun when one of us went into quarantine. So <laughs> the other had to do it on our own. Um, <laughs> but what happened is, again, I can't really remember the timeline, but the rules started to come in that a certain amount of people were allowed in certain spaces. We were very much a gray area. I think hair salons were allowed to open. So it was allowed one client per person working. So there were some people who have 12 people working with 12 clients in. Our space is 100 meters square. And we were like, we think it's safe enough to have six people in, spread out, all in masks, windows open. 
And it actually became a COVID activity for people. So we had this stretch of having come out of the first, the second lockdown, sorry, of people knowing about us when there wasn't so much else going on. Come on, let's lift our spirits. Let's go and do a cake decorating workshop. So we were lucky enough to have that period of time. And then by the end of that first year of 2020, we were kind of back up running, had busier classes. Then we went into another lockdown of January, which we just were like, we've had pretty crazy run so far. Let's just sit back, sit this lockdown out. I was doing more online one-to-one, so we were okay, like personally, and Liat was still making cake orders, which she does. And then it was from like the February time onwards that we kind of had to really focus on building up the business without any interferences, so to speak. I'm really curious, if you don't mind me asking, why you thought it was so important to go in with a business partner? Why? I mean, you could have gone in with your brand and maybe got a silent partner or maybe gone in and done it alone and created your own cake school, an online cake school, extending your brand from London to Tel Aviv. Why was it so critical to, do you think it was just the personality and how you and Leah actually clicked or was it something that you were consciously looking for? It's a really good question. I think firstly, we clicked and it was really important and rare. We didn't know anything about each other. I think me moving country, let's not forget, it's not an English speaking country here. We speak Hebrew. I don't speak Hebrew. Well, now I do a bit. I can now host a cake (laughs) class in Hebrew pretty much, which is quite an achievement. But back then, I didn't know the locals. I didn't know how, where you get your ingredients from. And plus, whilst I had an international audience, especially Tel Aviv is quite a closed community. She and Liat is the cake maker in Tel Aviv. We met on that first date. We looked each other in, in the eye and we said to each other, sounds like we've got the same idea here. Let's do it together because we don't want to be in competition with each other. And we were honest from that day one. And then every idea was just bouncing to and from. Then we found out we had a family connection. And then everyone in the family was like, oh, like it's so-and-so's daughter, and <laughs> which always helps. But honestly, I think there was a part of me that maybe I was like, oh, yeah, I could do it myself. Looking back, and especially knowing now, could not have done it myself. I could not have thought anyone else to have done it with. So lucky to have found her that we had built up such an incredible brand. It made it more enjoyable. Cake decorating, cake making is a lonely job when you're doing it from home. It's so nice to moan about how your buttercream's not working to someone who actually <laughs> experiences the same thing. Which I also think why this podcast is amazing is because people listening do have an interest and can relate as well. So yeah best yeah. decision and also i think it always goes back to what rachel says because i witness it i'm not the baker but it just looks really lonely right on your own doing this it's sometimes very therapeutic though to have that time out but yes but if you were just doing it oh, every no. day oh, and yeah. you're, you know you're in a debt because it brings me to my next question is you know you've led a very busy baking career so What you haven't talked about, though, is like those moments when you just kind of crashed and burnt yourself out. And, you know, because I'm sure you've experienced it. And I'm just curious what you did to reckon or how what you saw that as like, how did you recognize what it was and how you got out of it? So definitely several times (laughs) that's happened back when I was making cakes and especially now. And actually, it comes into context, especially right now. So we're in May 2023. And I don't know if you know this about the studio, but Liat and I have come to a joint decision to actually close the studio at the end of June. It's been an amazing three years of what we've built up. But I think you said it, and there's all sorts of reasons, but the main thing is financially. We had this dream. We've done it. The business has done incredibly well. Mm. We've never been in any sort of debts or anything. But having planned out at the beginning what we thought we'd where we'd be in three years time and reflecting on where we are three years later because of how you know we opened mid-pandemic etc etc cost of living crisis it's not just in the UK trust me (laughs) butter is insane it's insane at the moment anyway all these different factors that we didn't see I wasn't expecting to meet my husband two months after I moved here and get married and go on honeymoon and, you know, thinking about the future. And a part of it is 
it's almost this constant struggle and fight because with a school and I guess with cake orders, you're always fighting for that next order to come, that next person to book. And you do reach a point as a human being that you get burnt out. And what we both came to a joint decision of is as much as we love what we've created, as much as we love what we do, we're a bit tired of the fight. And yes, we've paid the bills at the end of the month, but it would also be nice to take home a salary. (laughs) And like I said, we're not quite at that point that we had hoped to be three years down the line. So let's be sensible and make a decision whilst we've built this amazing brand. And also what's important to note, we've also through Baker Street, the studio, we've done a few online courses and we're actually in the process of recording another one, which are these pre-recorded courses that we do together, which also makes it more fun and are sold globally, which we do get paid from as well. So let's focus on the, this amazing thing that's come from the studio Let's do the sensible move of closing the physical doors and also focus back on ourselves and what I've been building up over all these years. And I know we've like raced through that three years, but it's just been this crazy insight of what it's like to run a baking school, what it's like to do absolutely every little bit of the business, speaking with people, social media, teaching, cleaning, buying ingredients, everything that comes with it plus doing our own thing. So I still do the odd cake order here. I do my YouTube channel. Liat still does her cake orders. And then so we can kind of just go, enough fighting. Yeah. Take a moment. There's only so much one can do and it's okay. And I think it took a for us to realize this isn't a failure. This is we did something and now we're closing the door to one thing and opening the door to another. And it's also come at an amazing time because I'm also releasing my book. So did you know what, Georgia, just looking back and reflecting on your, I mean, you're still really young as well, I mean, on your (laughs) career, but I mean, you've almost gone and dabbled in in lots of things and done really well in them. Like you've built up single-handedly a very successful cake business on your own. You've then worked with brands and partnerships, which you continue to do. So you understand that you built uh, successful social media presence against lo- across multi platforms as well. Then you move country. Then you set up a successful cake school. Now you're releasing a book. It's almost like you've doubt. And you also, I forgot to mention that you've worked in. You've been a head chef in cafes, right, and <laughs> restaurants. And so you've learned, had all these experiences. And each time, it's like it gets to a point where you're like, all right maybe I should do this or try that. You're not willing, you keep pushing yourself and you keep it getting to a point where you go, all right, I've hit some doors here. I'm going to go push this door and let this door, uh, close that other door. And I think it's really brave. Thank you. It's really refreshing. (laughs) And because it's not easy to let go of something. It's not, these are your babies that you've let go of. And It takes a long, long time sometimes for that to settle and let go. But it's almost like you're always uh, at the next. All right, what's next? Right, I've got my (laughs) book. (laughs) Yeah, the other thing too is I actually quite appreciate you sharing that you making that decision to close that part of your business here on our podcast. That's very, I feel quite like, wow, broken some interesting news. But I think this news though, it really just summarizes the challenge of being a business owner, entrepreneur is and versus the outside world looking in at what it's like to be an entrepreneur and how you rate success and how other people rate success and the pressure that you put on yourself versus what other people see. There is so much in this wrapped up in mental health and struggles. And, Absolutely. You know, and, it, and because it's your own business, you can't separate from it when you go home. It's just there the entire time. So this shit is not for everyone. <laughs> it's just not. Like not everyone can be an entrepreneur. And you just find ways to manage the stress and anxiety on a day-to-day basis. And you find so much out of it, but you have to look for the long term. And I think that's what you're doing. What well, you're, you're moving pieces around this puzzle for the success in the long term. Because while you have certain things that are doing very well, some things aren't doing as well as you want them to be, and that's why you're making changes. And I think you, as long as you stick to that and you're 
which you are, and you don't let other people think, oh, well, then she failed at this. I, you can't say that because I don't yeah. think you failed. Like if you went and asked you of the people who went through your class, did you enjoy it? Did you learn something? Who's going to say, no, I hated it. I didn't learn anything. It's just not going to happen, right? No, exactly. We've taught hundreds and hundreds of people life skills. We've learned so much. And it's something that, a couple of things that are important. One, I never regret anything. Even back in my animation days, doing art things, everything has taught me something along the way. For example, animation, I learned how to do my website for my cakes. For example. Secondly, stay true to yourself. Don't pretend to be someone you're not. Don't pretend to be this like, for me, like, oh yes, my business school, the school's amazing. Let's just forget all those bills that are, you know, like be real. We're real humans here with feelings and lives to juggle. And then thirdly is to really separate what other people think. And for me, that's one of my hardest things, but that's also why I don't share too much. And I'm specific on my cake profile about cakes yes I shared a bit about honeymoon you know people do like to see but like for example sharing the post about our studio closing was giving me anxiety what are people going to think of me am I a failure have I moved country and opened this new school and then all of a sudden I'm closing no I'm just being realistic here and it's okay it's okay for things to close it's okay to say enough I'm going to do something else luckily it's come at a good time with my book. It's also going to give me the new the freedom to travel more with it. I've got some workshops in the UK coming up, hopefully more later in the year, hopefully in the US, etc. There's all these opportunities that having this physical studio space was preventing me from being so flexible, which was my actual original plan of moving here. So it's kind of like this lovely circle. And like I said, three years later, I've improved my teaching skills. I can speak another language, kind of. If anyone who knows me was probably laughing because I think I can. <laughs> but I've developed these huge skills that I would have never been able to do having not have done this journey. There's no right or wrong. Everyone has their own story. This is my crazy yeah, story. Yeah, I think it's a lovely story. And I don't regret one bit of it. Exactly. And it's just, it's nice because there's a lot, you know, even though I've got five pages of notes about you, I still don't know who you are until I sit down with you and talk to you in person. To You've say, been yeah. quite emotional listening to your story, actually. But also just such, Aww. really, you know, you don't see it that often, people posting on Instagram, like, oh, we're closing this. It's seen as, and maybe it's more of an internal feeling, like I haven't failed, I haven't given enough, I haven't done. But in essence, if you don't close that, you will not open doors to the other things that you want to do and the other opportunities that are waiting to happen for you. And so by you closing that, it frees up your headspace, it frees up and then it expands so you can then go, okay, let's see what happens next. I have some ideas, there's some things that are going to get pushed, but it also allows for other things to come to you and then to see the net the next reiteration of exactly. your journey maybe a food network host or bake-off host yeah, or... Who knows? <laughs> anyone listening <laughs> no, and I, but I think it's also easy to get very overwhelmed with the what ifs and oh I could do this I could do this anything but I think it's also important to do baby steps at the moment like our studio is closing in June there's a lot to get through until the end of June so I'm not going to think about next year already and that's something I think new because I was very much like thinking quite far and in between. I was kind of thinking in the moment and thinking far ahead, but this time I'm really going to take time. It's okay if not everything happens in the next month. It's okay. Let's see. Yes, there's, there is financial stresses. Luckily, I've got, you know, a, like YouTube and other incomes that I have built up over the years and with the book as well. But yeah, to be really in touch with my sense of knowing what's right for me taking breathers. I was going to say one of the best things about living here is that on Saturday, it's Shabbat, it's the day of rest and no one works on Saturday. As a self-employed person, it's very hard to switch off, but I've really incorporated that in my life that once a week I switch off, I'm barely on my phone, I do not post, I don't do anything. And it really helps me think clearly about the rest of the week, which is crazy. And I never know what the new week's going to bring, not being in a routine, etc. So yeah, I think it's really helped me get to this stage as well. And hopefully will get will help me get to wherever I end up in the next few months because it's part of the excitement as well. 
It is. It's great. Well, listen, thank you <laughs> so much for sharing. We have to finish off with our little tradition of a quick fire question round Ooh, for you. Amazing. First thing that comes to mind, you can explain it. You don't have to. And I'm going first. Your preference, please. American buttercream, Swiss meringue buttercream or ganache? Or is there something else? Swiss meringue buttercream. Okay. Very good. <laughs> I feel like you knew yeah, that. Definitely. <laughs> I just saw one of your latest cakes and it was like... Yeah. Sometimes uh, we are surprised though by people. I know, but I can tell. You can tell when someone uses a mm. Swiss meringue buttercream. It, it's a different texture. One aspect of bacon you won't compromise on. Butter. Very good. I love it. What butter do you get over there, by the oh way? Oh my God. There's a butter crisis at the moment. If you're lucky, <laughs> you will get regular European butter. Funnily enough, the Israeli make is a very white butter, which works amazingly well in buttercream, keeps it white, and it doesn't have much flavor. So you actually taste the meringueiness from it. But it sometimes just goes missing from the shelves. And so you run around and getting like one block from him on, and then you're like, oh no, I have to spend double the amount on getting like the European butter is a whole thing. But I do not compromise. Yeah. I would rather spend double the price on getting the butter than using anything else than my recipes. Got it. Before you answer this question, I forgot to ask you, what is the name of your upcoming book? George's Cakes. I have it here. George's Cakes. Right. Perfect. Perfect. So you can't use this answer, the, use the book for this answer. Can you share a baking book from your bookshelf, please? Okay, I can't use my <laughs> I think I'm going to go with a classic, Delia Smith. Oh, we've not had that answer. No, we I haven't. Still, a lot of no. the recipes that I use are based from hers. Classic, like classic things that you can't mess with kind of. Works. I thought you were going to say your cordon bleu. Like... Yeah, or something like um, no. Don't no. think I've opened it since I left. <laughs> Who would you want to make your next birthday cake? <laughs> Can I say me? <laughs> it, can't, it can't be you. <laughs> no, only because birthday cakes are like my excuse to do something new and crazy that like a customer hasn't asked. Uh, I see. Can you trust someone else with that brief? I could definitely trust Liat. Or I would love to see my husband Tal try and make me a cake. Oh, there you go. Because he's still one. getting used to what like my style of cake is all about. He's still like cheesecake for him is cakey enough or like a babka cake. That That's his kind of cake. <laughs> not sponge of buttercream that I made a birthday fun. cake for Rach once yeah but it wasn't like to her style it was probably more to my style <laughs> it made this <laughs> what did it look like <laughs> had like cream and strawberries and a vanilla Victoria sponge and, yeah it was, it was, it was, it was deli- I thought it was great it was amazing I think that yeah I had free cakes it was amazing <laughs> and as a cake maker you get so sick of cakes as well right? yeah exactly it's like well you're never making this so I'm going to make it <laughs> anyway listen thanks Georgia so much really really appreciate that and enjoyed it and I'm sure we're going to see so much more coming out of you in the um, next good year. Good luck with the book. It's going to be amazing. Thank you so much. This is so fun. So fantastic to you guys. And yeah, hope to see you in real life soon as well, not just virtual. <laughs> very, very soon. Bye. Thank you. Cheers. Bye-bye. That's episode 21 of My Baking Journey. Hope you enjoyed it. Everything you need to know about Georgia is in the show notes with links to all her websites and social links. We are back next week. So if you want to automatically be notified that a new episode is out, just hit that follow or subscribe button in your podcast app and you'll be all set. Just a reminder, this podcast is brought to you by the team at Olba. Packaging for bakers designed by a baker. We will see you in a week's time. Bye-bye.